Hi, Stephen from Own or Disown. Acer has followed up on their Triton 700 with the Triton 500, slimming down the footprint so that it is 35 millimeters less wide and about half a pound lighter. There are basically two models currently. There's the RTX 2060 for $1,800 and the RTX 2080 Max-Q starting at $2,300, although a 2070 Max-Q one is rumored. Now both come with a 512GB PCI Express SSD, 16 gigs of RAM running in dual channel and a 6 core i7-8758 CPU. Both also have an 84 watt hour battery that is good for 6 hours of YouTube streaming at 25% brightness. For $2,800 you get the 2080 Max-Q model with two 512GB SSDs running in RAID 0 for a total of 1TB of storage, but they force you to get 32GB of RAM. Now for me, as I will show you in a bit, I bought the 2TB PCI Express SSD for about $230 and installed it myself. Now the 2060 model has Optimus, but the 2080 model using the Predator Sense software you can either um, run it with a dedicated GPU or the Intel GPU after a restart. Whilst using the Nvidia card you have G-Sync capability which is awesome. Now with G-Sync on I was still able to get 3 hours of runtime which isn't bad. Or, if you enter the BIOS, you can change it so it is in Optimus mode. This is useful if you want uh, the 6 hour battery life and you have software that can take advantage of the NVIDIA GPU. Note though, that uh, you do take a frame rate hit when using Optimus. Now, if you don't like the boot logo or the noise, you can turn this off also. This is very handy if you are at work. Build quality is also very good. It's not like the Razer 15, but it's definitely more solid than the MSI GS65 and Acer definitely uses a thicker gauge aluminium here. Now it's not CNC machined, but it's stamped out of sheet, which means the screen does have a little bit more flex than the Razer, which is fine if you open and close it in the center, but I always felt that gripping the left hand corner would make the light bleed worse. And as you see here, I have the Razer 15 on the left alongside two Triton 500s. I actually bought uh, the one um, on the right as a replacement for the one in the middle, which at the time I thought had bad light, uh, bad light bleed, but it was actually even worse. Now I also have a viewer who also bought two, and each one of those had the same layer bleed on the left hand side. The panel is made by AUO, it's 144Hz and 1080p. It has decent color accuracy at 94% sRGB and at 315 nits it is also pretty bright. But compared to the Razer 15 I did feel that it lacked a bit of contrast when viewed from above. The Razer screen certainly seemed to be whiter. Acer also allows you to boost the screen to 3 milliseconds, but to be honest I couldn't really tell any difference. In my ghosting test they were both pretty similar, even with the Triton set to the 3 millisecond response time. The chassis is anodized black, like the Razer 15, but if you are wanting uh, more a non-gaming design then perhaps you might consider the Razer or Aero 15. Unlike the Razer, the blue Predator emblem on the lid cannot be turned off as it uses the backlight of the panel. The Razer continues the clean look with the venting at the hinge whilst the Triton 500 has a more typical air venting style. The big benefit though is that the cooling on the Triton is definitely superior. On the left hand side there is a blue anodized heatsink, the power port, gigabit ethernet, USB 3.1 gen 1 type A, HDMI 2.0 and a separate mic and headphone jack. On the right there is another blue heatsink, two more USB 3.1 type A ports, a mini display port and a Thunderbolt 3 port. So you can out to actually output to three monitors. Now despite the thin bezels, the webcam is also up top. So this is the 720p webcam. It doesn't look that great. So perhaps not ideal for where for streaming, but this is what it sounds and looks like. The keyboard has a decent distance of travel and is well spaced. I found it similar to an MSI Steel Series keyboard. I like how you have separate keys for altering the key brightness, and on the right there are keys that are used to alter the speaker volume and give you media control. It's great to have a key dedicated to opening the Predator Sense software as well. Now my only criticism being that the power button is a little bit too close to the delete key, so you may actually put the laptop to sleep accidentally. Now above the keyboard there is a turbo button that maxes the fans and, and increases the base clock of the GPU. Key brightness is adjusted using the FN keys. The Windows Precision trackpad is made of glass. It is actually on the small side but it has a nice chrome accent around it and it responded very well. Above the keyboard 
are some uh, air intakes. I do like how the sides of the keys are also painted white, so they actually stand out and that certain keys are coloured for easy access. Although we don't have per key RGB lighting here, the keyboard is actually lit up in three zones and it is fairly bright. The Predator Sense software is quite useful as well. The Home tab lets you have a quick glance at the temperatures, lighting profiles and uh, GPU overclock status. Now the Lighting tab allows you to pick uh, different pattern presets and colours. The overclocking option is only available when you're actually on AC power and gives you two levels of GPU overclocking. I found that the max boost clock didn't go up but the average clock speed did increase slightly and found that to get the best out of it you really need to reduce the CPU power throttle. Here actually are my throttle stop settings. Basically change the multipliers to 37 and apply an undervolt. And in this footage of Battlefield 5 using DX11 Ultra settings I have turbo boost on the left and uh, turbo boost with undervolted on the right. Here I have overwatch epic settings with max fans on the left and on the right we have turbo mode with the undervolt settings. I definitely saw a nice improvement here. Now I did try overclocking it with the MSI afterburner but was only able to get an extra 100 megahertz out of it and I didn't see any tangible improvements. Acer also gives you control over the two GPU and one CPU fan. Auto fan at idle is pretty quiet at 34 decibels and even under load it is not bad at 45 decibels. You can actually hear it when the fans are maxed out, but at 52 decibels, I definitely heard a lot louder. They also provide some temperature monitoring options too. Now, audio is handled by Waves Max Audio, which allows you to switch profiles, but using the speakers, I couldn't really tell much difference between gaming and music. The speakers are located at the front edge and fire downwards, and compared to the Razer 15, they are definitely two or three decibels quieter, but still pretty decent. By default, the laptop CPU defaults to a base clock of 1700 MHz, so you do need to change this to 2200 MHz in the power setting, so you don't lose performance. To gain access inside, you remove 10 Torx screws. Now you do have uh, nice air intakes, and uh, you can see that you have two speakers here. The rear panel is stiff aluminium. Much of the front edge is taken up with the 84 watt hour battery. And here are the two speakers and the Intel 9560 Wi-Fi card. Two fans for the GPU and one for the CPU. There are four blue anodized heatsinks, although I wish they were larger for the CPU. The rest of the components are actually below the motherboard and I honestly don't know what the benefit of having an inverted motherboard is. Now from a design standpoint, it is the same as the MSI GS65 and I don't like it. It wouldn't be so bad if Acer offered an RTX 2060 or 2080 SKU with 16 gigabytes of RAM and two SSDs. Because let's face it, 512 gigabyte is nothing these days and making it difficult to get access to that empty slot makes no sense to me. Now, I took this apart and it's not for the faint of heart. You peel off a huge piece of sticky tape and, uh, and then disconnect the battery. You will see a number of ribbons often covered by tape. Many have a plastic clasp that must be raised before you pull it out. You remove the Wi-Fi card and a number of power plugs. Now with everything unplugged, remove several screws from the motherboard and the GPU fans and lift out the motherboard. Now mine had a Western Digital PCI Express SSD and I added a two terabyte one alongside it. Under a metal cover are the two sticks of RAM. If you are feeling bold, you can even repaste it while you're in there. Uh, note that Acer uses paste to cool the chokes and the VRM, so you will need to clean all of that off and apply some new paste, and I used IC Diamond. Now, do I recommend doing all of this? Well, only if you are confident about doing it. I won't lie to you, when I put mine all back together, it did not work. I must have opened it up at least six times and ended up replacing the, the RAM, and then it worked. Now, was it bad RAM, or did I just have a, a loose cable? I don't know but it shows it's not easy and it's not plain sailing. Now the benefits are good of course. Now I have a two and a half terabytes of storage and the CPU is about five to eight degrees cooler, meaning that it peaks at about 88 degrees with no need for an undervolt. Here's Far Cry 5 using ultra settings on the left um, is turbo mode and on the right is with it repasted and you definitely see a nice improvement. But Acer 
obviously doesn't want anyone to do this. Now, if you're wanting to use the Triton 500 to process real-time audio, it failed my latency mon test. Now, this is a recurring issue with RTX laptops, and indeed, two graphics drivers are causing a lot of latency. In the V-Ray benchmark, it actually was actually slower than the RTX 2070 Max-Q in the Dell G7, and, you know, by quite a good margin as well, but it's still faster than any GTX uh, laptop. In my handbrake and code test, it was also slower than the Dell G7, actually only matching it once I reduced the CPU power throttle. But gaming is where the Triton strengths lie. Its performance is on par to a non-Max-Q 2070 and uh, close to a GTX 1080. Now this is quite an achievement when you consider how portable and quiet and cool this laptop is. The AWSD keys are about 30 degrees, with the warmest part being about 39 in the center of the keyboard. You can see hot air being expelled from both sides and the rear, so those three fans are doing a great job. Underneath, it's not bad either. I recall competing thin and light laptops running in the mid-50s. Even though the power supply is only 180 watts, I saw 165 watts being pulled from the wall at load, and I didn't see any battery drain while gaming. It performed great in the, you know, the benchmarks Firestrike, Time Spy, and Port Royale. Here's Ghost Recon uh, Wildlands at Ultra Settings. Max fan on the left and turbo with undervolt on the right. Although, although the frame rate is similar, the CPU temperature is definitely lower. Ray tracing in Battlefield 5 works great. Here it is in Ultra Settings and it is finally playable. On the left is Max fan and on the right we have turbo with the undervolt. I hooked up the Triton 500 to my 35 inch wide 3840 by 1600 monitor to see how well it would cope with higher resolutions. Now this is Battlefield 5 DX11 Ultra settings and I'm still getting the frame rates in the mid 60s, which is more than playable for me. Here is a summation of my gaming benchmarks. I was very impressed with this 2080 Max-Q. The average frame rate is in the green and the minimum is in orange. I also indicate what I saw with turbo mode enabled. And in some games, we see about a 5% improvement, but in some, not so much, until the power throttle from the CPU was removed, like in Overwatch. I also averaged all the clock rates, the temperatures, and the watts, showing them in this chart, with max fan in orange, turbo mode in green, and turbo with the undervolt in yellow. Now, turbo mode does increase the watts and the temperature, but is reduced when, the down, when we downclock the CPU and undervolt. Now, despite this though, the clock speeds are not hugely different, so perhaps just using the max fan is the way to go. So how would I sum up the Triton 500? Well, it is a very well built laptop, and it visually does show uh, some gaming flair, but you know, it's a little bit more subtle than usually, uh, say the red bling we associate with many gaming laptops. And I do like the blue look. It's not as classy looking as the Razer, or as business friendly as perhaps the Aero 15 or even the MSI GS65, but they do offer the ability to move the boot up logo and the boot up sound and even turn the key lighting off. The speakers are above average and the keyboard is pretty good and you have one uh, extra one button press for commonly used functions and their software is actually pretty useful. Gaming performance and cooling is very good, probably the next best against the Asus Zephyrus. I have two main complaints though, the backlight bleed and its upgradability. The light bleed looks to be pretty common across all of them, and it may take a few tries to get one that is acceptable for you. The inverted motherboard is just plain stupid, and if it's possible to get this through a system integrator who can add the RAM or add more storage and even do a repaste while still under their warranty, that is definitely the way to go. Still, for $2,300, my 2080 Max-Q is the same price as many 2070 Max-Q laptops, so that alone makes its shortcomings easier to accept. I'd like to thank you for watching. Remember, like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.